edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Talon. I also have with me Jeff Squires of Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks again for your time. Hey, Brock. Love doing these kinds of things. You always get to hear something new. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can find us online at www.rce-cast.com. You can find all the old shows on there. See a list of people we're looking at talking to, and if you have contact for any of them, let us please let us know. You can also follow me on Twitter at, at Brock Palin, and you can find that off of the website. Me too. I think I'm uh, at Jay Squires. And um, a little note to anybody who's listening out there, if there are things about MPI that you would love to see explained, let me know, and I'll, I'll do a little bit about it on my blog because – just off the cuff, I did something about eager limits a week or two ago, and uh, Brock sent me back afterwards. He's like, hey, that was really useful. I could show that to all my users. And so, you know, if uh, you, uh, gentle reader out there, have anything you want to hear about on the MPI sphere, uh, just uh, let me know. I'd be happy to talk about it. Yes, that, that was very useful. Also, uh, I'm going to be at the TerraGrid conference, which is in Salt Lake City this year. That is coming up in July. It is July 16th through 21st. Uh, if any of you guys are going to be there, be sure to track me down. I'll be walking around as a campus champion there representing the University of Michigan. Uh, so I'll be there if anyone else is going to be there. All right, so let's get on to our uh, topic today. I think you have a, uh, a special affiliation with our guests, so why don't you give the, the introduction honors here? Yeah, yeah. So uh, our guest today is uh, Rodney Mock of HyperLogic. He's actually going to be speaking to us uh, about a lot of the questions we have about Windows HPC Server. I've personally never ran an HPC Server setup. Uh, Rod's unique in that he actually got me into this business. Rod hired me back in 2004. 2004-2005 as a student employee at U of M uh, running a bunch of Mac and Linux clusters there so this is how I got started in this business so I owe Rod a lot for getting me on track in a great industry yeah thanks uh, thanks Brock I said uh, I knew you would be an excellent uh, employee and I'm glad to see that uh, you're now running the podcast with a small uh, small world and I also worked with Jeff in the past on LAM and uh, then open MPI so it's got great yeah. to see you guys yeah we go way back and, and was, before we were recording I was saying uh, people need to stop using LAM <laughs> <laughs> please, yeah. please please upgrade to open MPI and stop asking us questions about LAM yeah, you can do like the uh, Microsoft IE6 web page, and they'll stop using IE6. You just yeah, make a stop right. using LAM, and you're like, you can pinpoint where in the world people are still using LAM. So. <laughs> well, by the by, the kind of a segue here, um, we're talking to Rodney here because he his company does a lot of consulting around Windows HPC, and Windows HPC is not something that a lot of us know about. So it'll be interesting to hear about it because. Uh, at least my particular bias is mostly focused on Linux and other POSIX -y kinds of OSs um, and the HPC in those arenas. Now, Windows HPC is getting more popular, so we figured uh, let's hear something about it. So, Rodney, I wonder if you could give us a little of the background here about why you can uh, talk to us about this stuff. Sure. Yeah, we have a consulting company, HyperLogic. So we do a lot of Linux consulting. Uh, we also do Microsoft HPC consulting, mostly for manufacturing, uh, automotive, because uh, we're out of Michigan. So we do a lot of CA, CFD, a lot of commercial off-the-shelf shelf apps. Uh, we're an HP, HPC elite partner. So we put together clusters, support them, manage them. Uh, and for Microsoft, uh, I, you know, definitely, like you said, Linux has been, uh, you know, kind of the de facto standard for a long time. And but as Microsoft uh, came out with their stack, they're now in the third version. It's gotten to the point where it's actually uh, very interesting, and we've seen a lot of customers in the uh, manufacturing space adopting it for different types of uh, point solutions. And uh, even in uh, larger companies in Tier 1 automotive, we're starting to see a Microsoft HPC server. So we've been doing uh, – we have tools and solutions in that space. We do development and consulting. So I uh, thought we could come today, you know, having a kind of a mixed background. We see both sides of the fence of – Done operations development, we could maybe hopefully you know uh, talk about talk to the H Microsoft HPC space for your listeners that might be interested in kind of what's different or what what is what is Microsoft doing in in this arena. Just stress that uh, Rod's a good candidate for this because as I mentioned at Michigan he was running all Linux and Mac clusters so and he still does Linux quite a bit of Linux still actually right Rod. Yeah, yep, yep. We still do a lot of Linux. Uh, so, you know, it, uh, uh, we can talk about like what, you know, what is a decision point uh, when you go to, uh, when you're trying to decide Linux or Windows, you know, often, um, you know, there, there's, a, there's some criteria that may make one more preferable over the other depending on your situation. 
Well, yeah, actually, let's dive into that. I mean, what, what, why would a customer choose Microsoft HPC? And <laughs> I, I don't mean that nearly as confrontational as that sounds, but, you know, a, a big chunk of the HPC industry is Linux. So what would lead somebody to the, to the Windows solution instead? Well, often what happens when we go to a customer site, the engineers, maybe they're using a Linux cluster, they don't have necessarily Linux expertise, or they face problems like they'll have, they'll create an input file on Windows, and they have to deal with like Unix to Windows line conversion, all those like little things, ha having to FTP files back and forth. And so the, the Linux, uh, for the end user, the engineer, they almost don't care, right? They're just trying to get their job done, whatever is the easiest way to get the job done. So often that barrier is, uh, uh, that Windows reduces that barrier a little bit if the engineers are Windows focused. Now other shops, uh, the engineers all want to use Linux, so it just depends on the environment. The same thing goes on the flip side, the, for the IT administrator, uh, often they, if they don't have Linux skills and Linux comes in, we often bring Linux into a Windows only shop in the past. And, uh, you know, IT, gen, you know, corporate IT is, has maybe a more difficult time handling Linux than they do, um, than they do a Microsoft solution. Now I should say that just because you have a Microsoft solution in place doesn't mean that having Windows skills makes you an HPC person. You definitely need to learn you know, the, all of the part of HPC, but that does lower the barrier of entry for folks who, if they, if they aren't, aren't familiar with HPC and they aren't familiar with Linux, it's just at least one of those two you knock out, you knock out if you uh, want to consider HPC. And kind of the third realm uh, that's new is that if you want to, like, utilize, a lot of companies now are going to Windows 7. So you see a lot of Windows 7 workstations out there, and especially in engineering, these things are almost like mini supercomputers. I mean, they got eight cores, a whole bunch of RAM, you know, what they, they were more powerful than the clusters we used to run at U of M back in the day, and they're sitting under someone's desk. Uh, HPC server lets you basically schedule on those boxes seamlessly, so you can use it, even if you have a Linux cluster, you could use it as a point solution to do cycle scavenging on Windows uh, boxes, and you could do this in the past with third-party solutions, but it's, uh, it's way, way easier now with HPC server than it other, ever was before with, uh, like, having to buy off a third-party app to do it. So a lot of people are used to seeing Windows machines, you know, a desktop, that kind of interface. Uh, is there anything about running an HPC, uh, a Windows HPC server setup that is going to feel very desktop-y if you've been running Linux things before? Well, kind of the dream of HPC server is that the, 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 you actually submit from your native application, and you should never really even realize that you're submitting to a cluster necessarily. So... Applications like Ansys, there's some uh, good apps out there that do have that you know dream realized. They've using Microsoft APIs. They submit to the cluster. It's it's basically transparent. If you want to go back to uh, where your application doesn't have that level of integration, then it's not that different than using uh, a Linux. There's a command line API. You can do like job submit. Um, you know the the big difference between how you submit maybe to an HPC cluster versus a Linux cluster is what are you using instead of writing Bash maybe you're using Bash files or PowerShell. Um, so so it's definitely a little bit different skill set, but it's not vastly different. There's a command line you can you don't have to use the GUI to use the GUI tools though they have all GUI interfaces, web portals, uh, standalone thick client you know command line. So whatever you prefer, they don't you can choose choose any of the above. Okay, so that sounds like they've actually reproduced a lot of stuff that we figured out um, in other batch environments for a long time. What about actually moving code over that was originally developed in a Unix Linux environment? Do they have POSIX compatibility? How hard is it? Well, they do have a. Uh, there's this thing called SUA, which is basically a full POSIX compliant um, uh, implementation on top of the uh, Microsoft kernel. So you can install that. It has like aux, sed, grep. You can basically compile any application with very little change, but that's not really the way. If you're going to do that, you're almost. I think you might as well stick with a uh, stick with Linux. Um, but if uh, there's a lot of toolkits like PGI makes some nice tools that uh, allow you to easily, you know, take a pure uh, a Linux Unix heritage code and make it work on Windows. Um, you know, a lot of the changes are just like uh, on Windows you have .obj instead of .o. You have to change your make files slightly for that. Uh, PGI actually has a pretty good tutorial on on uh, migrating uh, over some classical HPC codes over to Microsoft, just to kind of show you what the steps were that you had to uh, do. You know, what did they have to you know change? 
uh so it, it's a it's but you know it's it can be non trivial or it can be uh uh you know it could be a, an effort just depending on how many assumptions your code makes about the fact that it's running on linux like how do you do your directories do you assume slash temp is there you know are you using fork you know stuff like that all right, so along that line, you know, my particular bias is MPI, you know, and hypothetically the MPI API is exactly the same uh, between Linux and and uh, Windows, and a lot of people have experience porting between different versions of MPI simply because, you know, there are fundamental differences, for example, between OpenMPI and MPitch, the two big popular open source ones. So I would imagine um, that the MPI portability is not so much the issue. It's really all the other little things. Is that kind of an accurate statement? Yes, that's correct. The MPish layer is, uh, not, the portability issue is not there. The, the, the Microsoft MPI is based on MPish too, so if, it's compatible. All right, and what version is uh, the HPC server based on? Are there, are there different versions? Uh, you know, what, what do people use out there? There's basically one version. There's uh, the eight, they've had three versions of the product, uh, but the version that you get is HPC Server 2008 R2. So that's like a whole huge mouthful. But that that's the main version, and it's broken down into a couple of subsets based on what functionality you need. Okay, so what things are included in there? I mean, you know, typically, and again, I can only speak from my experience on the on the Linuxy side. You know, there's a scheduler and a resource manager and a, a queuing system and things like that. You know, are these kinds of things involved on the Windows HPC stack as well? Yep, that's correct. Actually, they have let's call the a, a, a pack, an express pack, and it has all those things basically for free. If you already have a, a, a Windows a server that you've played for, paid for, Server two thousand eight R two, it has message passing, job scheduling, uh, reporting, sysadmin deployment, all that stuff is included for free. Now they also have like an enterprise pack that gives you some additional functionality, like being able to run on Windows seven workstations or using Excel on a cluster and some other uh, functionality like that. So I've I've heard some stories and was speaking with Microsoft reps when they come by about uh, infrastructure needs and so that's been some confusion for people like I need an Active Directory setup or I need a quite a large Windows infrastructure to even support this is is that true and what is really needed? You do need Active Directory, uh, but there's very few businesses that I have encountered that don't have Active Directory installed. But it is true, Active Directory is the main requirement. Uh, you could always install Active Directory separately if you needed, if for some reason your company uh, didn't support Active Directory, but, but that is a requirement. Okay, so because I, I had heard things like SQL Server was required to be able to collect statistics because I stored it in a SQL database. Uh, so none of that's, is that just an optional requirement and it's not needed to actually run the server? It includes SQL Server Express, which is free, but if you want to run, let's say, a top 500-style cluster, then you would want to put full-blown SQL Server on there if you want to collect uh, full, de uh, full debugging, etc. cetera. That, that, that would be true. Speaking of, of top 500, what is the largest Windows HPC cluster you've seen slash been involved with? Uh, they have a, They just did a petascale cluster, the one over the Tsubami over in Japan. So that was, I think, 1.1 1 .1, uh, petaflops and over like 1,300 nodes. I think it was number four on the top 500 last time I had checked, though. Um, to be honest, the majority of the installations we're doing, you know, top 500 are like few and far between. The majority of the clusters we see uh, in the uh, in manufacturing, et cetera, you know, under 256 nodes. Um, you know, I've seen as large as uh, 512 nodes that we we've done with H with Microsoft HPC Server. So it just depends on the implementation. For Windows Workstation nodes, we've done up to a thousand Windows Workstation nodes with uh, being scheduled under Microsoft HPC. But but yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's 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 certainly they can do top five hundred. Obviously, top five hundred is dominated by Linux right now. All right, so they're not really targeting it, though. It'd be fair to say they're targeting more the the commoditization market, the, the bottom fifty thousand uh, kind of market. Is that accurate? Mm, I can't speak for Microsoft. I'd say if the if people wanted to buy in the top five hundred, were buying Microsoft, they 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 can scale to that level. They certainly design to that level. And they've shown through, you know, doing top 500 runs that they, they don't have scalability problems in any part of their stack, whether it be MPI or, or just loading or the reporting tools, all are go scale up to the, up to the top 500 level. 
it's just that um, there's not, like I said, the, the top 500 customer base, that's 500 customers in the world. <laughs> there's a, uh, they're trying to grow the market, I think, where I see, where we see uh, personally us deploying Microsoft, Microsoft HPC server. Our customers that would not have done a Linux cluster certainly wouldn't have done a uh, you know, top 500 type cluster. Uh, but need uh, manufacturing needs to reduce the time to, uh, to engineering. They need to reduce solving time. They need some kind of cluster technology. And so I, I see it enabling a market that maybe wasn't there, wouldn't have been there if we would have stuck to just traditional, um, you know, putting XCAT or, you know, some type of uh, a Linux solution out for a customer where that, that would have been a difficult uh, sell to that, uh, that user base or that IT department. So I want to back up a little bit. You mentioned a Tsunami cluster at Tokyo Tech. Uh, the first version of that uh, just ran some Linux derivative, but I had also seen some numbers of that running Linux. Is that like a dual boot environment or something they're doing there? Um, do you see that kind of environment often? I personally don't like the dual boot solution, though you can certainly a lot of customers do that. Um, I know BMW and there's a bunch of universities that are using like stuff from adaptive computing and platform that allow you to dual boot based on what you need. But I, I personally like Linux or Windows. I don't actually come into a scenario with customers that, they're, that they want both. Now, why do they want both? What kind of requirements uh, would that be? What's the benefit of that? Well, one would be if you have an application that has a, a very nice native integration with uh, Microsoft HPC Server, that would be one, uh, one, one area where I could see that beneficial. Or you're developing on .NET, uh, uh, Microsoft is investing in different uh, types of languages and technologies to improve writing parallel code. I mean, you guys develop code, you know, it's hard to write uh, parallel code. And so if you have an application like that, uh, that would require basically Microsoft platform, I could see that being another requirement. But um, um, normally, uh, when, when we're going into customers, they want one or the other. We don't have, uh, we're not trying to decide for them which one that, uh, that they need both. So for the uh, cluster administrator, if they hook a console up to a compute node in the Windows HPC world, will it have like a full desktop on it? Or is this like a lean, stripped down version of Windows that goes onto compute nodes? You can strip it down if you want to, but it's basically Server 2008 R2. Uh, what they do is they uh, you're not allowed via licensing if you want to run the, the cheaper version of HPC. You can't put a, like your Active Directory mail server and everything on it. It's just uh, they give you a reduced price, purpose built basically to run uh, computational uh, loads. But, uh, but yeah, it'll look and feel like uh, regular Windows. You don't have to. Um, in, uh, but like just like on Linux, if you install Red Hat, it comes with uh, Bluetooth enabled and all those types of things. So you still want to tune it down if you want to get uh, maximum performance, but it's certainly not required. There. All right, here's a random question out of the blue. Um, I am on the uh, MPA3 Fortran committee for really obscure reasons because I don't really know a lot about Fortran, but somehow I'm in this group. Is Fortran supported on on uh, Windows? Yes, they support Fortran. Now, uh, it's either with PGI or Intel or a third-party uh, compiler vendor. Uh, but yeah, they do. They have Fortran bindings in their MPI library, and you can use PGI or, or, or Intel. All right. The reason I ask is because there's a, you know, a Huge boatload of existing uh, Fortran MPI codes out there. They might not very well be the target since, you know, portability is not necessarily the main issue here. But um, certainly, uh, particularly with modern versions of Fortran, it's actually pretty kind of kind of analogous to C++. It's a fairly modern language. But a couple of people have asked me about that, whether it's supported on Windows or not. So I figured I'd uh, give an ask here. Um, here's another obvious question. What networks are, are supported by Microsoft MPI? They support the standard fare, uh, InfiniBand, you know, Gigabit Ethernet, 10 Gigabit Ethernet, uh, MirrorNet, you know, all the major interconnects. They have a network direct provider. So uh, now, while what Microsoft doesn't actually produce, like the OFED stack, obviously that's you know a consortium of people developing that. So you would obtain your InfiniBand layer, you'd go download that. Um, but they they have a committer on that uh, that helps, um, and I'm sure you're <laughs> you're involved with that as well. So, but yeah, all the major interconnects. <laughs> Yeah, I actually do. I'm, I'm asking a few questions that I know the answer to because I know the <laughs> Microsoft MPI guy. Uh, yeah, we're both yeah. on the, the MPI forum together, and he and I get along pretty well. Good. But um, yeah, so still, all right, give a little explanation of what, what's Network Direct because I, I assume most Linux people won't know what that is. 
Yeah, when they when it's basically direct to hardware. When they first came out with the very first version of uh, this product, uh, they actually had a like abstraction layer between that and the hardware, and it made it so that their performance numbers weren't good. So when you saw benchmarks, you, you know it reinforced people's uh, preconception that Windows must be slower. So they fixed that in the next release with this network direct that basically gives them a, a, just a small shim that, that lets them have direct access to the hardware. And then you get the latencies down and the things that you need when you obviously want using a, a, a low latency interconnect. And, and now you see the numbers when you see Linux Windows benchmarks, uh, you know, they're, they're almost identical within a few percentage either way. And that's because of that change they made in uh, 2008. So what kind of latencies are you seeing? I mean, we've had a lot of focus on um, RDMA-type networks and stuff on uh, the Linux platform, and there's this big existing infrastructure of Linux HPC systems out there that are latency-focused. What kind of numbers are the Microsoft guys getting? The same. I mean, it's not. They're not limiting. Uh, they're not being limited by the fact that it's Windows. Let's say uh, with the Network Direct, you get the same uh, latency kind of numbers. When you look at the application performance, you almost can't tell the difference. In fact, some sometimes they win, sometimes they lose. But it's it's not a deciding factor anymore. I have never gone into a customer and they said we need Linux because it performs better. At least with us, that's not the um, that doesn't even, that conversation doesn't happen anymore. In the old days, yeah, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna go off on a little rant here too, saying that you know it is real application performance that that matters. Micro benchmarks have their place, and there is certainly some chest thumping going around saying I have the lowest latency around and things like that. But you know I've said this actually many times on my blog as well. Like you know low latency is great, high bandwidth is great, but it really matters what's your application gonna do. And there are a lot of latency sensitive applications out there, but there's also a whole lot of them that aren't, even though they think they are. That if you run it uh, over TCP and you run it over InfiniBand, you're not even going to see much of a noticeable difference. And so I would say, uh, I would assume that uh, Rod is right, right? If, if they've got InfiniBand latency down in the one to three microsecond range or maybe even four, uh, probably doesn't matter particularly for the target uh, audience that we've talked about a little bit here on, uh, on the podcast. Yeah, a lot of times customers, they don't, they don't come to us and say, we need one microsecond latency between nodes. They say, I need this application to get this model ran in this amount of time. Whatever technology meets it, uh, that's, that makes them happy. So we, we often you know, don't talk about, <laughs> talk about uh, the, those micro benchmarks with customers. We're talking about applic at the application level. So what about file systems? I, with uh, small Linux clusters, a lot of people start with just NFS, but sometimes they move into things like PVFS, Luster, uh, Gluster, a few of the other like more exotic parallel file systems. A lot of those I don't remember seeing Windows support for. Does Microsoft have their own solution for high-performance uh, I.O. operations? Nope, they don't. They still rely on third parties for uh, high performance. I mean, you could certainly put in something like a Fusion I.O. card, which is, uh, you know, <laughs> if you need, re need really fast bandwidth to one particular node. But, uh, yeah, they don't have a parallel file system of their own. They definitely depend on third parties to provide that kind of support. So something I probably should have touched on earlier in the conversation is how is it licensed and what are the, the costs of this? Because one of the deciding factors in HPC is cost. Now we're kind of moving away from that as HPC is getting commoditized. You know, it's exactly what you said that the engineers, you know, they, they don't care about whether the job finishes at midnight or 3 a.m. just as long as it's done before they get in in the morning. And in, you know, a traditional enterprise kind of world, cost isn't the major factor anymore where, where it used to be in the, you know, the academics and the researchers, they have the, the least amount of funds and they're trying to get the most bang for their buck. So how did Microsoft approach their licensing and their cost structure? How does that work? It's basically licensed per server. So you have a, and you don't need Cal or uh, with the access licenses, but yeah, per server, or if you're using Windows 7 workstations per workstation, in terms of the cost in a corporate environment, you know, like you can say, okay, we can use CentOS, that's free. But a lot of times in a corporate environment, they want to have Red Hat. They want to have that, hey, I want to have support. And then you layer on the other pieces. Well, we need this commercial scheduler that has support. And then we layer on another layer. We need some kind of reporting mechanism. That comes from your scheduler vendor. By the time you assemble those pieces, I don't really think cost basically becomes an, uh, becomes an issue. Uh, because you end up having, uh, really, on the, on the way it is today, the most expensive person or the most expensive part of the solution is the software and then the person running it, um, at least in our space. Uh, the cost of the, like the OS and the, even the hardware nowadays has gotten to be you know, not the most expensive piece of the puzzle. 
Okay, so taking all that, I mean, and and you coming from a, a Linuxy Maxi kind of background, I mean, what is is your take? I mean, is this a good product? Is this something that people can get worked on and and have confidence in? How's the support on it? You know, all these all these kinds of things. Yeah, I, I really like 2008R2. I think deploying and standing up a cluster if you have Windows skills is definitely uh, way easier. Um, but of course, if you come from a Linux background, you know, you have the same, you know, XCAD, there's lots of toolkits to choose from, you know, some, uh, there's disadvantages and advantages of both, uh, with windows HPC, it is nice. You have, you know, one stack, you don't have to wonder, does this version of MPI work with this version of Linux? I mean, Intel's trying with Intel cluster ready to basically kind of make a, a monopolized stack there to create the same kind of uh, consistent ecosystem. But I think it reduces the uh, amount of testing you have to do in, in that sense, um, the one thing I really love, I like command line, so I do like to have PowerShell, and uh, and I like you know being able to use being able to use the break open a command window and 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 but there's different skills. So one sometimes people note when they're trying to especially an app that was ported, you know they say wow there's it's not just point and click. Not every application on HPC server is point and click. So just realize that at, uh, um, that you still you know for Linux people are trying out Windows you still you're going to use your skills it'll be just a different technology you're using. So very early on you mentioned something about cycle scavenging, uh, picking up XS cycles from machines at night. I'm guessing just like you know your your desktop at work. Um, can you tell us a little more about yep. that? Yeah, basically, if you have a, it has to be Windows Seven. But if you have a Windows Seven workstation, you and uh, and you basically install this little uh, cluster compute pack on it that and it joins to the cluster and then that's available basically for scheduling jobs so you can set up things to say if the load is too high or during certain times don't schedule on those nodes but they basically become a resource and actually a lot of linux only shops uh that have linux clusters we've been deploying the solution because you just basically put a head node down at their site they already have all these windows 7 workstations that they've paid the capital expense for and now they're able to actually utilize them off hours. Why before all they were doing is costing money, right? Sucking up energy, not being utilized. And so that has been a, quite a popular uh, use of HPC server, especially in the last six months where we've seen a lot of Windows XP to Windows 7 rollouts. So we've been doing quite a bit there. So do you see uh, these even being used during business hours? Like, you know, the, the secretary or, or even the engineer who really all they're running is, you know, Outlook. And, uh, you know, they're, they're barely using their machine. Are, are those types of environments being used during business hours to say, like, take over half the cores on their machines? I mean, machines are coming with two and four and eight cores standard these days anyway. Yep, we have uh, a lot. Of, we have so several projects uh, currently going on where the customers are trying to avoid actually buying any kind of cluster because they're like, we already have the equivalent of a 512 node cluster here just in our engineering department. Why don't we just reuse those resources? And so that that is a is an area that people are interested in. They're trying to avoid even buying a cluster. Just reuse the resources they already have. Now that's fascinating. Are, are, are they trying this with desktops or with laptops? I mean, does it work with laptops when, since they they come and go? And you know, how does that uh, impact a, a running job, for example, if someone it's running on a laptop and then I close the lid and walk away? The majority of the ones we've been doing are actually uh, workstations, like HP workstations. Um, but uh, you could do it with a laptop. But that is true. If they unplugged it, you know, the job would crash. You could schedule it to requeue, but. Uh, but I haven't done one with a laptop, so it's probably not, the, yeah, not, not as good a use case, not as power, powerful as a workstation still today. So when people are running this uh, cycle scavenging version, are they generally running serial codes or single node parallel jobs? Or you know, what's, what's kind of the more common way of using this? Often they uh, they use SMP if you have eight cores. Uh, the limiting factor often is the price of the software licenses, to be honest. Uh, like uh, uh, some of these uh, third-party ISV applications are extremely expensive. They don't actually have enough cores to run a large job. Many big clusters are just running lots of little jobs. And so for them, yeah, if they can run an eight CPU job on, on one box, great. They don't need to run across. I do have some folks that are running across to gigabit Ethernet, though, uh, doing a distributed parallel to get the memory down. So farming out all these jobs isn't, you know, in the input data, in the output data, and everything else uh, isn't starting to put extra stress on the corporate network. Often in places we go, the because uh, I'm in manufacturing, I should uh, uh, say that in manufacturing, the engineers often have their own dedicated network 
they're usually gigabit because they are large transferring large files around to each other. So no, it's not it's not like it's going out on the corporate backbone and back you know, it's on a, it's still on a dedicated network. So are people running mostly ISV codes or is there any homegrown stuff or is it mostly focused on, you know, your abacus is influence and things like that? Well, from uh, you know, and, and uh, this is this is where from from our perspective, we live in manufacturing and also in oil and gas. So between those two, uh, a lot of that is, um, um, is is ISV applications. Some of those have like Fortran, where because they're Fortran based codes that where you are putting in like user defined libraries. But certainly, some customers are running their own uh, codes. Um, it's just our customer base is mostly ISV. Uh, ISV apps, financial services though they are all basically uh, custom, and HPC servers is uh, becoming pretty popular in uh, in that space because they also support SOA and some other types of models that are popular in financials. Now I know that Microsoft is investing heavily in trying to, and you mentioned this even earlier in the call in the call here that you know they're trying to make it easier to write parallel code. Do you have any of your customers doing that? Or is that something that you can talk about at all? Give some examples because we all know that it's, it's difficult to write parallel code. I mean, I, I guess I'd be interested in hearing how are they trying to make it easier? Yeah, in a previous life, you know, I worked at a compiler company where we were developing tools to help people write parallel code. That isn't the market I haven't been in anymore. So to be honest, none of my customers are trying to write parallel code, uh, though I, I do follow the space because I'm still interested in, 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 developer, uh, in the developer community. We definitely develop a lot of our own code, but it's not uh, you know, HPC. Um, so yeah, I couldn't speak to that. I think it's very interesting what they're doing in the space, but uh, I still think the majority of applications are MPI-based today. Open MP. So I'm going to go off into the weeds into a really weird spot here. This is a relatively small market, really, really large SMP machines. We saw um, SGI take the Altix from the Itanium platform, which Windows did support back to you know, your regular Nehalem chip that we get on a you know two-socket server from Dell. Uh, are, do you see anybody using Windows HPC on a 128-core SMP machine or anything like that? You certainly could. There's no reason that you couldn't. Um, though, yeah, like I said, majority of our customers aren't trying to buy a big scale-up SMP solution, uh, mostly because it's still cheaper to buy a bunch of smaller, cheaper boxes than to buy one big expensive box. And especially in manufacturing, if that one big expensive box goes down, you're out of business. <laughs> and you have a bunch of little boxes. If a couple go down, you're not out of anything. So um, I, I don't see big S and P boxes too often in our space. So, uh, Rodney, I know you're not Microsoft yourself, but do you know anything about the, uh, you know, upcoming releases? What are some new cool, neat features that are coming and when are they coming and things like that? Sure. Yep. They're having another release called SP2, which is going to be out maybe by the time this podcast is available, you can download the beta currently and try it out. Um, some of the new features that they're going to have, one of the big ones is they're going to have uh, support for Azure. So you're going to be able to actually just put a head node you know, at your site and run your MPI jobs basically on Azure, which is like a, uh, a cloud slash hosted uh, solution. Um, so that, that's kind of the big uh, functionality. They're going to support VM roles, and you'll be able to actually see your uh, on-site file shares remotely on Azure and be able to access those. That sounds cool with all the standard uh, cloud HPC-ish questions. How do I get my data there? How do I keep it secure? And there's uh, all kinds of things like that that we talked about when we had Nicole Hamsloth on here with HPC in the cloud. Yes, yeah, so, on a while ago. But yeah, yeah, those solutions don't. You know, the cloud. The, you know, there's that whole cloud talk. Though I can't say in terms of cloud security, uh, you'd be surprised. I, I, you know, how insecure a lot of customer sites are. The cloud may not be any less secure than their site already is, or you know. But uh, <laughs> but I oh, could say uh... that. But I could say it's a it's a nice solution for people that maybe only once in a blue moon need to run uh, a larger job. You can spin up, and like you had mentioned earlier, they just care about getting the job done. Does it run slower? Yep, sure it does. But they get the answer uh, by the time they need it, which is the important part. I, I can't say I've heard that argument about cloud security before, but <laughs> it's it's uh, probably um, I, I wouldn't doubt you. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Rod, thanks a lot for your time and uh, clarifying a lot of these questions we've had. We've had Microsoft reps come through here, and, you know, they're not necessarily – they're the same Microsoft reps that are selling desktops, so we've we've had some HPC-specific people. But it's it's great talking to someone who's actually stood it up and used it and actually got stuff running on it. So, Rod, where can people find you, and how can they get a hold of you? 
Yeah, you can reach us at hyperlogic.com. That's H-I for highperformance.com. Uh, and we do, uh, like I said, if you have any questions, we also have a uh, website just dedicated to our tools for HPC server called totalcae.com. Uh, so either either place you can reach us at. Okay, well, thanks again for your time, Rod. All right, thanks for your time, Rod. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. It was a lot of fun. Thank you.